Fernando. He has tremendous number, lots, lots of experience. In fact, but over 20 years as a renowned leader, a global experience and expertise, and, uh, an educator, mentor, motivational speaker. He continues to enrich lives all around the world by fostering essential leadership and personal life skills for success. He owns a master's degree in organizational leadership and he continues to do the will of God. Help me welcome this evening none other than Minister Luke David Kwamena. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. You may have your seats. Well, I pray that you're ready with an appetite, hungry and thirsty to consume the Word of God. How many of you love Amen. to partake in the Word of God? Amen. So we're going to pick up from where we were last night. My dad said a good teacher usually does a review. So let's do it very quickly. Hopefully you were taking your notes. I told you there were three things. That as a believer, you must be a good steward over. A believer, it is required of us to be faithful stewards. God wants us to be fruitful. What was the first thing? It starts with T. Time. Well, I want to give everybody a gold star, but I don't have enough. Time. You don't have forever to obey. It's going to come a night, just like we heard in the parable Fool, tonight thy soul is required of thee. That means you have no more time. Everybody will get to the day where we no longer have time. Now it's eternity. For it's appointed unto man once to. And after death is what? You've got to go prepared. The second thing we must be good stewards over is what? Talent. Whisper to the person next to you, what are you doing with your gifts? What are you doing with your gifts? Please do not be standing around in the marketplace. Do not stand around in the marketplace. The kingdom of God is about work. You have to produce. You have to bear fruit. Do not let the master come by and you're looking leafy and green. But in the time that you're supposed to be bearing fruit, you are not bearing fruit in season. So you've got to be a good steward of the giftings that God has placed in your life because somebody is depending on you to obey God's call. My father used to play cricket for Trinidad and Tobago, went through a broken heart experience, walked down in church, a man was preaching, Pastor Carly Chanka saying, God, Christ can make a difference. He gives his heart to the Lord six months after he preaches his first message in First Church of the Open Bible. And now it has been, I don't know how many years, but thousands of lives have come to Jesus Christ because of one man's obedience. But the preacher needed to preach. And I don't know who got the preacher saved and who would have witnessed to them, but I'm telling you that's what happens. What about the Sunday school teacher that won Billy Graham to the Lord? What an important soul that was in the kingdom of God. Millions came to Jesus Christ because of what that one soul. You don't know who God is going to use, going to reach through you. You have to obey. The third thing we must be a good steward over is our what? Treasure. That includes your money. How many of you believe that it is your birthright to be rich? About four of you believed it. I don't have time to go through it, but I've grown up, grown up in the church, and I can tell you there's been a lot of poor teaching around increase. I never teach on money. I teach on stewardship. Treasure is one of the things that we must steward over, but anytime you walk in the principles of the word, you are bound to increase. It's actually impossible to stay small if you walk in the commandments of God. I have chosen you, I don't want to get ahead myself, John chapter 15, but I have chosen you that you may bring forth fruit. 
And then when you are bearing fruit, I realize that God's management principle is that he is never impressed with our current performance. He is more moved by our remaining potential. So what does he do? He prunes. Why? He's not just impressed that you're bearing fruit. He prunes. Why? So that you will have more fruit. You will see it in John 15. And then he's not even impressed with that. He prunes you again so that there's what? Much fruit. That means God wants to get everything out of you that he placed inside of you. I came that men may have life and have it how? More or what? I could give you all the cautions about wealth. Let me release you tonight. Job chapter 8. Do you want me to show you? I'm on assignment. I'm on a mission. Job chapter 8. Let me give you this very quickly. Might be sick. Give me a second here. Hmm. Let me let me get the help of some Google right here. I have to find this scripture. I want to see you that see this. Thirty one. Strange. Unless it's another. All right, 31. Let's go to 31. I'm probably talking about another. 31, 24. Job 31, 24. We hear scriptures like, money is the root of all evil. The love of money. We hear scriptures like, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Or easier than for Camel to walk through an eye of a needle. You hear scriptures quoted like that. And what that has done is made poverty seem spiritual and rich means seem carnal. So the person who has riches is ungodly. But if you study the scripture, God wants you to have riches with honor. It is possible to be righteous and wealthy. Everybody say amen. amen. I want to see the people of God in abundance. Wealth. We are not living in lack. We live in more than enough. We must be lenders and not borrowers. Let me give you the only caution. You don't have to worry about it. Get as much as you can increase. Because when you are steward. You do things in a certain way. And when you do things in a certain way, it will increase. A steward will not only increase money. A steward increases any resource that is possible of multiplying. Put plants in a steward hand, they will make it, you'll see the plants flourishing. Put animals in a good steward hand, you will see the animals flourishing. Put people in a good steward hand, you will see the people flourishing. The opposite is also true. When the steward is poor, I don't care what resource you put in their hands, it will die. It will get rusty. It will get overgrown. It will not be taken care of. This is the only caution I want you to remember. Do not put your hope 
in riches. I'm going to give you three cautions in scripture. Don't put your hope in it. That's where we run into problems. If I have made gold my what? Hope. Secondly, or have said to find gold, thou art mine. Don't ever put your confidence in riches. It will take wings and fly away. This is the only caution. Don't put your hope in it. Don't put your confidence in it. Go down again. If I've rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gotten much. Look at the next verse. In another verse he says, I kissed my hand. You did this. You are the hard worker. You can, look at the work you did. Wow, you did a good job, boy. Kiss his own hand. He said, you are the person who did this. It's by your might and it's by your power that you have gotten all of this. And my heart had been what? Secretly enticed or my mouth has what? Kissed my hand. Watch, next verse. This also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have what? Denied that God is... That's all you had to be concerned of. Don't put your hope in it, don't put your confidence in it, and definitely don't put it above God. Get as much, but keep wealth in its rightful place. That's the danger. You should not increase, and then we stop seeing you in church. All of a sudden, you got too busy, huh? You don't realize why God retards wealth from some people's life? Because he will lose you. If God really gave you what you were asking him for, he would lose you. When a son gets wealth prematurely, he may distance himself from his father and then be called a prodigal. Never ask for wealth without wisdom and don't ask for inher inheritance without instructions. This is the only caution. Luke, let me tell you something. I will bless you and through you shall the what? Nations of... Anything God does, once he touches it, there is an abundant overflow in it. A man come to our God and say, God, I don't have one son. I just want one. His name is Abraham. They call him Father Abraham had many what? See how God does things? You ask him for one. He makes you a father of many nations. It is impossible for God to do things small. When you know my God, you get an abundant mentality. So, I had to press pause and tell you all that because I want as many people in the kingdom of God to be wealthy, but get your riches with honor. Keep a good name, a good reputation, a good witness. Be a person who is giving. Be very charitable. Let the unsaved speak well of thee. The real riches is in your name. Money or currency is the lowest level. Money is the lowest level of currency. Character is the highest level of currency. I went to buy some gravel for my father sometime, and the person said, 15,000. Say, for me now? Say, bring, bring back that, bring back that. Person took off about 40% of the bill. When I sat down in the car, the Holy Spirit says, Luke, are you living in such a way that when people ask, who is your father to your children, they'll give them a discount. That's what the Holy Spirit told me. He says, your father's name is what gave you that discount. His character was his currency. So don't get the wealth and have a poor name. Don't do anything to get wealth. There is a way. If you'll study Psalm 72, Psalm 73, there is the, wick, the, right, the riches of, of the unrighteous and there's righteous ways to get wealth. So, when we were in John chapter 6, the first thing is that the five loaves and the two fish were put in God's hands. 
I'm saying this to you, if you want your life to be fruitful, you have to submit your life to the hand of God. Too many Christians are hanging out in the pavilion of the kingdom. Murmuring about what needs to change, what could be improved, what could be better. Get on the field. Time is running out. More people need to be on the field using their gifts. My father launched a medical center in San Fernando called Acropolis Medical Center. It is seeing hundreds to thousands of patients every week. When he was launching it, voices arose. Why are we going into medicine? We should traditionally stay in the church. To which he did not reply. Because some people are stuck thinking that the work of God, everybody is going to come through those doors. Do you not realize that when you are part of the kingdom, you are a carrier of his presence. You are infected with kingdom culture. Wherever you go and people interact with you, the kingdom of God is now at hand because you are there. If you are in education, you shine your light. If you are in business, you shine your light. If you are in medicine, you shine your light. You don't wait to say, well, come to my church. It will come to my church so you can receive a word. Come to my church. I understand there's a place for inviting people to church. But if the only time you believe that your neighbor will experience the presence of God is in church and not in your presence, we've got to change that. My good friend David is in the back there. I can show you my inbox. We win people for Christ in the marketplace. Don't just do business and think that you are not a minister. You are a minister. Every one of us are called to win people, win the lost at any cost. That is how we have to train and empower the church today. Otherwise, we are going to be way behind there are many other kingdoms that are being built right now. And they are very strategic in how they are building and how they are recruiting. And the church has to wake up and we have to have a fresh hunger for souls. And we have to become innovative. If you can't get through the door to Jesus, bust a hole in the roof. You have to be innovative to get people to the feet of Jesus. The church cannot be behind when it comes to innovation, creativity, and change. Let me say this. The learning inside the church must match the speed of change outside the church. Otherwise, we will go through organizational extinction. We will die. 2020 showed the readiness of organizations for change. And many were not ready. It is a sign of when the time comes. And it's time for the bridegroom to pierce the eastern skies. If you feel we weren't ready for a pandemic, you will see lack of readiness when Jesus comes. And the, the people of God who are responsible to get people ready, it's the church's role to go to the nations. Go to the highways and the byways and tell them, come and fill the house. You've been invited. You've been recruited. You are loved. Somebody died for you. Somebody bled for you. You are forgiven. We are the ones responsible with that message. No longer to sit down and just spectate. You have to become a participator in the work of God. So is your life submitted to the hand of God? Now, Jesus said in John chapter 6, he already knew how he was going to feed the multitude, but he still asked Philip. That means God has his will or a purpose for you before you come to him. Before the five loaves and two fish, were put in Jesus' hand, he already had a plan for it. When you submit your life to God, you have to submit to his will. I say yes, Lord, yes, to your, what? 
will. Listen, you've got to get married to the will of God. My father says, Luke, one of the first signs of a man of God is that he must know how to hear from God. Very early in your walk, you must know the voice of God because for the rest of your life, you have to know his voice so that you can know his will. He will speak to you. How many of you know God's voice? You're sure it's God's voice. Not a lot of hands went up. Listen, you've got to get familiar with that voice. For you to get more familiar with God's voice, you've got to get more familiar with God's word. I'm a little old school in this area. I find people don't study enough. Study. Young people, let me say this to you. You've got to pick up that Bible. You can't just listen to five-minute inspirational messages on YouTube by preachers. Study to show yourself approved. Because when you don't get familiar with the logos... You get confused with the rhema. And a lot of people feel that the rhema is the first way you hear from God. But that is confusion and I'll tell you why. I've seen many people say they hear from God, Pastor Pope. But when they tell me what they heard, it is in contradiction with the written word. And we as ministers, I'll tell you something. Sometimes you don't, you don't even want to stand in the way. Some people already make up their mind. So what we had to do, just humble ourselves, stay quiet, and let you go do what you say you heard. Especially in the area of marriage, I see it many times. You don't know the voice of God, you come. You did not come and submit to your leader. You tell them what you are already going to do and decide. And you're asking your pastor to bless what you already decided on. Problems later on. People don't know the voice of God. Listen, and there are more voices now, so it's harder to tell. And we are going to live in a time of deception, so things are going to sound true, but they're not truth. A time will come where there's a lot of people have ears itching for something new, and the Bible said they will get tired of sound doctrine. The ears will be itching for something new, and many people will be deceived. Find a version that you can read, young people. You don't have to read the King James if you don't want to read the King James. I put out on my Instagram status today, I don't know if anybody follows me, but sometimes people read in a version, and you really can't, I mean, some of the versions... You know, it might not work for you. So, for example, if you're reading the Message Bible, it might say, Mama, I'm hungry. But the same verse in the Amplified will be, Mommy, I am hungry, famished and starving. If it's in the NIV, it will say, Mother, I am hungry. But if it's in the King James, it will say, Henceforth, let it be known unto thee, birth giver, that my belly consists of emptiness. <laughs> if you can't handle the KJV, put it down. A lot of young people sometimes, they, because they don't understand, they put on the Bible because they're not grasping it. Go get a devotional. But it's very important for your future because every decision you make you want to know what is God's will. Do you want God to do amazing things with your life? Submit to his hand, but also submit to his will. What is God's will for my life? Jeremiah 29 and 11, I know the plans. That means God actually has plans for your life. My father gave up cricket to go to the West Indies to say yes to full-time ministry. That comes from knowing God's voice and following God's will for your life. And you will never regret it. I went through a broken engagement one month from the wedding. The day I married seven years, that decision had to deal with God's will. I had to hear the voice. 
My father stood there. He didn't give me, he didn't say a word because he knew he didn't want me to make a decision based on his voice. He stayed quiet. He wanted me to make a decision based on God's voice. Those of you who are not married yet and you want to be married, raise your right hand. Your pastor say, oh, glory to God. No man, raise your right, keep your hand raised. Don't put it down, don't put it down. Don't put it down. Don't put it up. I'm going to come into agreement with you, but I'm telling you this. You have to know God's will. Father, bless them. Send the right spouse, the right partner in the right time, in the fullness of time. Find a destiny partner for them in Jesus' name. May they hear clearly from you. And when you speak, may they listen and receive. In Jesus' name we agree. Amen. We pray for that in our church. Some of you sticking the raise on your hand. Don't do that. It is one of the most important decisions in your life. After salvation, who you get married to. And all the married people say? Yeah. You see, you see support? Listen, where you live is God's will. Who you marry is God's will. Who you associate with has to be about God's will. You have to be sold out to the will of God. And sometimes the will of God carries you in places that are uncomfortable. The plan of God. Very sacrificial seasons in your life. But in the end, you will lack nothing. If you give up houses for him, he will multiply you in the end. Give up family sometimes in one way. You have to give up certain sacrifices. Yes, you have given to the Lord. He will multiply you in the end. God is no man's debtor. The third thing is that you must submit yourself to his word. He lifted up this bread and the Bible says he gave thanks or he spoke over it. Now I want you to know how you get to the places in God is that he leads you by his word. He speaks and you turn right because that's what God said. But if you're not familiar with God's voice, you cannot be led just like that. Sometimes Christianity can lose its sense of practicality. But there's a big sense of practicality to the scripture. I have always said that a student anywhere is one that studies. A good student is usually one that studies, goes over their work, writes, revises. So when you come to church, don't think that you have to throw away all those student qualities around the Bible. To be a disciple, you have to carry those same qualities. To apply yourself to reading or to listening, to study. Exodus 17 and 14 says, repeat this in the ears of Joshua. So that it, it will, it, and write it in a book for a memorial. What that means, when you rehearse something in the ears, it becomes imprinted in your mind, in your thinking. These are qualities that we have to have. And let me say this to all of the families. Don't stop family devotions. Do you know it was a family devotion that saved my life when my mother explained to me what drunk in the spirit means? I read it, but I didn't know what it meant. So at 16 years, I went to Dr. Miles Monroe's church. And I went to a youth conference, and I wasn't paying attention to anything. And back in those days, we had no cell phone. So let's say if you met a girl, Sister Pope, you had to write down the girl's name and address, and you go back to Trinidad, you had to send a letter in the mail to communicate to her. You know about that? What, Sister Pope? Yeah, easy. People like David, he don't know about that. My good friend David, he don't know about writing letters. I used to write letters, and you pray, and you get right back. Today, you text, and you see the blue tick, and show up, you know she can read it. That's how fast you get a response. But back in the day, like my grandfather said, to marry a girl, you had to write a letter, and the parents will get out, open the letter, and then the response coming back by the mail. Can you imagine that? So 
I go to this conference, and I'm sitting there not paying attention to anything, and the message is preached, and I didn't pay any attention to anything. I just wait to go outside and hang out with all the young people, and I just sit down in the second row, and I start to cry. I say, but Luke, why are you crying for? You don't have any reason to cry. And the next thing I know, a pastor was waking me up, and I was laying down in between the rows. He says, Luke, your transport is waiting to take you back to the hotel. This is Bahamas. And when I go to talk to the man, I hear, Now, I get into think with my natural mind, and I say, what just came out of my mouth? So I am now speaking in tongues, but I don't know what happened to me. I didn't even know it was two hours. I just knew I was crying. That was the last memory. So I say, stay quiet because you're going to embarrass yourself. So you didn't know what happened just now. You tried to talk, and tongues came out. I go back to the hotel. I just shake my head to everybody. And when I go to the room, Sister Pope, I say, take a cold shower. It will wash off. Because I, I had no understanding of what this thing was. Remember, it's like 16 years old. I'm not paying attention to nothing in church. I don't have no focus. I don't have no hunger. None of those things. I'm just in a youth conference. So this thing hit me like this. I say, take a cold shower. It will wash off. I take the cold shower. I just I try to talk. I'm only talking in tongues. I can't get back to talking in English. That night, I curl up in the bed. I can worry that don't know is a family devotion. I remember mommy saying, let me explain to you what being drunk in the spirit is. It's almost like I had no control, but in the spirit, not till lunchtime the next day, I can speak English. That day, I opened the Bible and read from Genesis to Jeremiah in one reading. That is the day I got my life's message in Jeremiah 1 and 10. I've given you oversight of nations and of kingdoms to root out and to pull down, overthrow, to destroy, to build and to plant. But what made me feel okay to receive what was happening was a family devotion that explained to me what that meant because she was telling me of stories when they were teenagers and the Holy Ghost had filled them so much they had lost control. They were filled and overflowing. They had no clue of what was happening with them. That gave me an understanding which made me appreciate and open up to the experience I was having to Bahamas. I'm saying that to say to you, in family devotions, is where you can build the discipline of children sitting to study the word of God. Don't let everybody just go to their room. I have a hard time. I have a three-year-old and a two-year-old. They both have tablets, and they're not, they're not listening to me right now. I have to take a tablet out of my two-year-old hand sometimes for her to listen to me. This is what we are we're living, this is the times that we are living in. So just imagine trying to sit around something with pages. My, my daughters go up to the TV and do so. You understand what I mean? But with every advancement, there's a loss. And I'm saying this to we can't raise disciples if we don't build them around the right disciplines spiritually. And one of them is prayer. The second thing is the study of God's word. Turn to John chapter 15. So you submit to God's hand. You submit to God's will. And you submit to the word of God because this is how he leads you. Now, we're talking about being a productive and fruitful Christian. And I'm going to show you what is expected of you as a believer. For you to appreciate this. There are four things that you should have answered by this stage of your Christianity. There are four things that you should know now. Because most productive people, whether Christian or not, they are very clear about these things I'm going to share with you. John 15, 1, I am the true fine and my father is the what? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does he do? 
And every branch that bears fruit, he does what? All right, so look, there are two types of people in the church. Those that bear fruit and those that don't bear fruit. Look at your neighbor and say, which one are you? Serious question, though. No, it's a serious question. Do you know there's something called the Pareto Principle in organizations? It is where 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I pray we do not have that in the kingdom. I pray we don't have that in the kingdom. Why? It is required of everybody to give account, you know. You don't get to hide in the back. Look, every one of you, it is required of you to serve. Don't just attend and receive. Life is intake and outflow. Every well-discipled disciple must serve. Listen, if a church does not have members who are serving, it would not be healthy. Members must be connected with. Members must be placed in an environment to grow. Members must be given an opportunity to serve. And members must be trained to lead. Very effective in a healthy environment. Connections, growth, service, and leadership. Healthy church. So two types of people, those who are not bearing fruit and those who are bearing fruit. Now, let's see the mind of God towards people who are bearing fruit and not bearing fruit. You are already cleansed because of the word which I have spoken to you. One, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. That's the premise of fruit bearing. Abiding in God. You know, one of the things I must say, and I want to caution all the young people and let you know there's a serious time coming up in the time of the church. One thing I must commend the elders for. You know, Christianity is not like the celebrity life. We, we must not go down in that direction. Many people who have seen really come and try to create platform, lights, camera, action in Christianity, they never lasted. We have underrated faithfulness in church. Nobody needs to be a star, but you have to commend the elders. They have been faithful throughout the years. You understand what I mean? Ain't nobody say they had to go on TV, go on tour, write no book. Faithful. He said, well done, thy good and what? Faithful. God is looking for what? Faithfulness. I can tell you I grew up in San Fernando Open Bible. When I think of my elders, they have set a consistent example for me as a young person. They have been faithful. They wholly followed the Lord all these years. Faithfulness. You want to be fruitful? You have to continually abide in him. This thing in Christianity, I have no off-season, you know. Some of these people, when things are going good, you can't see them. As soon as pressure hit, you have passed on speed dial. You are missing a prayer meeting. I see God break through for people, and as soon as he break through for them, they forget. You know, forgetting is a sin. The Bible says God was not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. Eh? It is unrighteous to forget. Don't let God bless you and then he lose you, you know. That is not good. God is not a spiritual Santa Claus just waiting for us to, to, to press him like a machine and, and have a blessing come down. God wants people to be faithful because not of the provision of his hand, but of the faithfulness of God's heart, the beauty of his presence. You just want to abide. There's no other option. You show me a good option. What, what else? What other options are there? There are no other options than to live and to abide in Jesus Christ. We are on the winning side. There's nothing else out there. There is nothing else out there. Where else you want to put? What other values you want to build marriage on? What other? They have confused the whole thing called marriage in the world. They have messed the whole thing up. 
People don't even know who they are as individuals. Then they've messed up the union. It's called holy matrimony, not marriage. It's called holy. Don't leave out the holy. It came from God out of the idea of marriage. Covenant came out of God. He defines it. His word established it. Where else we want to go? You go out there to live and to pursue success or to run after money, titles, fame, and all of those things, and you leave behind Jesus, you will lose big time. So you have to what? Abide in him. This is the basis of fruitfulness. It's almost like you have to keep your roots in the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, keep your roots in the Lord. Come on, come on. The Bible says, better to have a little with righteousness than to be balling out of control, everything expanding. Not faithful to the Lord. I remember one time under pressure, when Job was under pressure, his wife said, listen, didn't get too hard. Curse God and die. There's the price too high to serve God. We had to cut this thing. We serving him and this is what's going on in our life. This is what's going on in our business. This is what's going on in our family. It has gotten too hard. And you know, he gave a powerful statement. He said, how do you think we could just come and happy clappy when things are good? But when we're under pressure, we just walk out on him? No, God is faithful to us. In the good times and in the bad times, God remains the same. He's the yesterday, same yesterday, yesterday, same today, same forever. Copy God. Copy him. He's faithful to us. You be faithful to him. Copy him. Do just as he does to you. He doesn't change his word. So whether it's good times or bad times, you find yourself in the house of the Lord and be faithful. This is the foundation of fruitfulness. Faithfulness, abiding in God. He said, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in me. Verse 5. I am the vine and you are the what? He who abides in me and I in him bears what? Much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in me, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear what? Much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So what gets rewarded gets done. God is saying he gets excited and he is glorified when the believer is fruitful. Now we're building this thing. You submit yourself to the hand of God. You submit yourself to the will of God. You submit yourself to the word of God because we are developing the nature of being fruitful in him. So the foundation starts where you put your roots in the Lord. You abide in his word. You abide in his presence. Come on. How many of you know that, that you can hide yourself in the secret place of the Most High? As a 16-year-old, let me tell you all this, teenagers. I know prayer might sound like a little something boring sometimes. But this is where I, find, I found myself, you know, at these altars. One time a security guard called and said, Pastor, Luke and some of these other youths say they're not leaving the church and we're ready to lock up the church. Father say, well, lock them in there. Lock the gate, yes? When the security guard come to me and say, Luke, it is time to go. I say, the Lord said to seek him until and until they have me at. Luke, we are ready to go. I said, the Lord, it ain't happened yet. We were rolling on the ground, Sister Pope, fighting and asking God, why are we here? We want to know our purpose. Whole night we pray. This is how I found myself in God. You don't need prayer meeting to learn to pray, no? Oh, they really fall in love with this thing. You know, when, listen, when you fall in love with God, and one night my friends come to carry me to play football, they wait two hours outside. My sister said, Luke, they're waiting. But Brother Pope on them by my side of my bed to amplify it. The fellowship's so sweet. I can't leave. I couldn't leave. And they're waiting two hours. They say, all right, we're gone, we're gone. And I love sports, but the fellowship with the Lord was so sweet. 
I found myself in prayer. Let me tell you something. A prayerless, a prayerless life will be less sensitive to the voice of God. My mother used to watch me and say, Luke, I find you getting a little angry and you're snapping. How's your prayer life? Every time she said that, I wasn't praying. Check, check, check how you're reacting as a believer. Anytime you're on edge, check your prayer life. Prayer gives you a sense of God is in control. God is in control. Walk in peace. God is in control. Calm your nerves. God is in control. He'll take care of you. God is in control. Care is thou not that we perish. Sleep, Jesus, sleep in here. Care is thou not that. He says, peace be still. He says, how long is it going to take you all to believe? Just abide in me. Rest in me. So when you are abiding in him, I want you to know God wants to move you to levels of fruit bearing. Now let me show you where it started. Everybody say no fruit. That's where most people start. It's not a bad place, but you must fail forward. If tonight you feel like you're bearing no fruit, I don't want you to feel discouraged. But let today be the first day of you starting to think it's time for me to bear fruit in the kingdom. Now, you move from no fruit to fruit. Everybody say fruit. That's your first level. You must have some evidence that the Lord is working in your life. Four things, you can write this down quickly, that I have observed about people who bear fruit. One, they are clear about who they are in Christ. Their identity in Christ. They're not confused about that. Now, can I tell you, a lot of people are in identity crisis. You know what that means? The Lord found Gideon in a wine press. He's hiding from the Midianites. The Lord said, Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor. What did Gideon say to the Lord? I am the what? I am the least of the what tribe? Smallest, you see? That is identity crisis. When God sees something in you, and you see something different in yourself. People who are fruitful have clarity of who they are in Christ. Jeremiah, you give over sight of nations and of kingdoms to root out, to pull down, overthrow, destroy. I have appointed you long before your, before your, your mother's womb. I had already given you that calling, Jeremiah. But I'm just a youth. I don't have experience. I don't know what to say. Identity crisis. Moses, come here. I want you to go speak to the people. I want you to go to Pharaoh and say, tell, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. That they may be free to worship me. But um, I really can't speak, you know. I have a little st st stutter. You got to ask somebody to, to talk for me. I, who to tell them, send me he? He's not confident in who God has called him to be. If you have to be a fruitful branch, connected to the true vine, you have to be clear on who you are in Christ. Eh? Not anywhere else. In Christ. Second, you must be clear on your purpose in life. I know many people who are walking in Christianity and they don't know their purpose. You have not started to live until you found out why you are here. Where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. Martin Luther King Jr. says, unless a man knows what he will die for, then that life is not worth living. Why are you here? Because if you are not clear why you are here, you will not be clear on what you ought to finish before you leave. Your purpose leads to your assignment. I will not die. I will finish. Everybody already knows that. I speak very openly about death. My casket, I told them, put the word finish on it. All black, word finish on it. Why? Because I begin in the 
end in mind, I know how I want to finish this thing by God's grace. I want to be empty of all the potential that God has sent me to earth with. I'm not going back in heaven with no potential. I leave in every, you know when you're playing basketball, they say, leave it all on the floor. You know what does it mean? Leave it all on the floor. That means don't come back with no energy. When you come off this court, leave every effort of energy on the floor. That's how you have to leave earth. Leave it all on the earth. We ain't carrying nothing back. Yeah. We ain't carrying nothing back. You know this is not our home. <laughs> Tell the person, it look like they forget. Tell them, this is not your home, you know. This is not your home. You are here. Steward the time well. But when you leave, make sure you are empty of all God-given potential. Most people who are fruitful are clear on why they are here. Thirdly, they are clear on their anointing, what they have been empowered to do. Very different. When you don't know your gifts, you could be very busy in life, but not productive and bearing fruits. I see so many people study a degree for four years. Their passion is left. They're working right. And they're very not fulfilled in life. Their psychic compensation is very low. And they're not feeling fulfilled. Why? Because an unclear purpose leads to lack of assignment. What can I do? What is your gifting? I used to play the drums, and then one day my father said, Luke, no drums today. I said, Daddy, why? Because I just used to hang out on the drums. I played in that without practice. No, it's a natural talent the Lord gave me. I could just jump on the drums and play. He said, ah, no more drums. Come on this side with the pastors. I said, to do what? He said, to pray. I said, to pray? Come on, man. It's like, you know, it's like he pulled me out of my little comfort zone. And never return to the drums. You got to be under leadership who can see your giftings. You say, just learn to pray. I just want you to pray. I never knew that the Lord would call me to preach. I, I, let me tell you something as a pastor child. <laughs> I used to be vexed with my father and I had to go to church, you know. One time I just come outside and I get so vexed. I say, are oh, they going to church again? Or oh, you're not staying home? Every just Bible study, oh, I just get vexed. I had to wait long, long for it to come in the car. Sunday, everybody out there to talk to. I'm hungry. Them PKs know what I'm talking about. And we going straight home, eh? Don't stop by nobody. People think this pastor life is an easy thing. When you see your parents go through some things, you don't want none of no side of this ministry, you know. You running in the next direction. Ministry is tough. Or they don't feel so. Everybody feels the pastors are rich and wealthy and they're floating, and every time they get up, the mornings are anointed and pressure. I forgot why I was telling you that. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, it's the truth. Right? So, my father says, Luke, come and pray. But I didn't know I will end up preaching. When I was in college, they said, Luke, go do, I was working on college, and they said, Luke, go and do a, um, a student's perspective. So I went into a student's perspective, and a coach who will recruit students for college said, would you come to my high school and um, speak? Because some of the kids are not even inspired to go to college. I said, yeah, where's your high school? He said, in Georgia. I said, well, how are we going to get there? I'm in Fort Lauderdale. He said, I'll pay for your flight, pay for your hotel, and I'll pay you. I said, well, free flight, I go in. When I went there, I spoke for about 35 minutes. He said, well, you didn't tell me what, you know, if there's a charge or cost, so I just... I, I, you know, I gave you something or whatever. Let me know if it's okay. I said, no problem, man. I just put it in my bag and jump on the plane and go out there. I had him back on the plane. I opened the envelope. I see 1,100 U.S. So at that time, I was working for about 250 U.S. every two weeks as a student because as international students, I couldn't have a regular job. 
When I'm on the plane and I open the envelope, I say, this man I check right to do. I feel, I feel he make a mistake because I did not know my value. And then I'm going on the plane, I say, look, you're probably doing the wrong thing, you know. There might be something here where people are seeing something that you are not seeing in yourself. Then I restructured my, my path of development because I realized that the Lord was going to use my voice, but I didn't understand my potential. So then I changed what I was going to study so I could add content and experience in an area that I could now serve and be effective. When you don't know what God has gifted you with, you could be doing all kinds of things, just wasting away your time and you can't bear fruit because you're not aware of what he has gifted you with. You got to get clear. All my reports in, 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 in school, Luke is a good student, talks too much. Luke is a good student, talks too much. Same high school presentation, college asked me to come back and speak for a graduation. I see the same teacher. I say, sir, you remember what you used to say about me? I say, you realize you called me to speak for the graduation, though. And guess what I go and do? Talk too much. Sometimes you don't know what your gifting is. When God makes you aware, now you have to submit this thing to God. So this is how you begin to bear fruit. You have to know clearly who you are in Christ, why you are here, what you can do. Here's the big one, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow. Where are you going? A lot of people are just getting up with no clear vision. What is your vision in life? What is your vision in life? Tomorrow is very special. It's going to be impartation, but I want to talk to you as a church because I want to share with you one of the most important relationships in your life, and it is the relationship with the leader that God has placed over you. And I'm going to show you when you are fruitful, you are never put in a place to operate in isolation by yourself. God always makes you a part of a flock. The branch is a part of the vine. You don't operate in isolation, and that's part of how God protects you. But I want to show you how when you live your life, you have to think about life after you're gone. The kingdom of God has a component of legacy to it. And this is what I wanted to say to you. And this is very important to know how to honor the gifts among you as far as your leadership. There's coming a time very soon, because you know the baby boomers, you know who they are, right? There is a massive amount of wisdom and experience that will be removed from places of leadership in a very short period of time. And if the church does not know how to, what I call, sacrifice to get the wisdom of the forefathers, the sons and daughters of the next generation, we will be in trouble. It's too much wisdom being moved from places of leadership in too short of a period. The forefathers, they're not going to be around for a long time, but a lot of them are holding organizations together. But the question is, have we developed sons and daughters to walk in our wisdom, carry our spirit because 10 years from now, we could be in trouble if the transition did not happen with strategy and thought. And it's time for sons and daughters to stand up in churches now. The next generation. It's not tomorrow, it's today. Time for us to serve on a different level. Come and submit yourself. Pastor, what do you need me to do? Some of you doing that for corporate Trinidad, but you ain't doing that for church. You got to change that. Let's stand. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Come on, just lift your hands. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. 
If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart. Touch my heart, Lord. Speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can. Come on, let it really come from your heart. We just have a few minutes again. Let it really come from your heart. Tell him right now. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Oh, oh, oh. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Touch them right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Keep your hands lifted up. Father, we submit ourselves to you. Vessels. You require us as vessels to be clean, to be pure. Fit for the master's use. God, we know there's more that can be done for your kingdom. More that can be done for souls to be won. More that can be done for the hurting world to be healed. More that can be done for those who are broken to be mended. More that can be done for the blind to see, for the weak to become strong. More that can be done for the lost to be found. And if you can use anything, Lord, we ask that you use us. We are instruments in your hand. Let there be clarity of identity tonight. Let there be clarity of purpose tonight. Let there be clarity of giftings tonight. Let there be clarity of vision tonight. I pray you will stir up the gifts in this house. I pray that you will stir up the anointings in this house. I pray that you will stir up the mantles in this house. I pray that the sons and daughters of the next generation will stand up right now in their rightful place. Lord, don't let them sleep tonight. Oh God, don't let them be comfortable tonight. Speak from the heaven, oh God tonight. Uh, wake them out of their sleep tonight. Uh, let them have sweet fellowship tonight. Uh, let them worship tonight. Uh, let them call upon you tonight. Uh, and just like you did for me, God, uh, I didn't expect it, Lord, uh, but you gave me a dose of your Holy Ghost. Uh, you gave me a filling. Uh, you gave me a double portion. Uh, and my life was never the same. Uh, I pray in the name of Jesus uh, for an outpouring of your spirit. Yes. An outpouring of your spirit. An outpouring of your spirit for those who are hungry and thirsty. Let them put aside, oh God, what the affairs of life. The things that causes them to get entangled in life. You said, oh God, when a soldier, oh God, is enlisted, he is not caught up in the affairs of his life, but he is willing to please that which who en enlisted him. I pray tonight for clarity of vision. Come on, keep your hands lifted up. God's going to speak to some of you. You're going to have the hand of a ready writer. Uh, that tomorrow is going to be clearer. Some of you did not have a clear vision of who God wanted you to be. You had a clear vision for your business. You had a clear vision for your, your professional life. You had a clear vision for what you wanted to do as far as success. But you didn't have a clear vision of who God wants you to be. And God is going to show you that. It's going to change up a lot of things that you were making decisions for in your life. Father, we submit ourselves to your hand. We submit ourselves to your will and we submit ourselves to your word in Jesus name amen 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 come on let's give the Lord praise tonight oh Lord we bless you One more time, let's sing that glory to God. If you can use anything, Lord, come on as we as we lift your hands again. That's just and some of us you need to take the time and seek him until you feel. Touch my heart. Thank 
you, Father. Thank you, Lord.